Greetings, Hope students. Hey, we're excited because we are entering phase four. This means that we get to expand some of what we're doing. So a couple of different things I want you to know. Uh, right now, the first step we're taking is we're just allowing more people to be able to attend small group. It allows us, we're still gonna keep our in-home small groups for at least this week as we explore whether or not we could have a service here and what that would look like and weigh those values. But it does give us some expansion capability there. But the other thing that it does is it does let us uh, do an online version of Challenge, which is coming soon, uh, where because Challenge Conference had to get canceled, uh, we they're gonna do a one night stream and we are gonna hold that in the sanctuary downstairs. I'll be getting a registration up for that soon, so be looking for it. Um, but here's the good news. Challenge was going to be a conference we just took our high school students to. But because of the stream, we can open it up to middle school and high school students. It's a one-night event. It's a three-hour event. We'll host here. Be looking for those details. We're excited. Now we're going to turn to Michael. He's going to continue taking us through the book of James. Can't wait to see you guys. Well, hello, Hope students. <sighs> Man, so over this past week, I have been reflecting upon the state of the country, the state of people, the state of Christianity, and with everything going on, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to hope right now because we see so much discrimination, so much judgment. And, and it's hard because we want to elevate one political side or another, one opinion over another, one fill in the blank. It's something where there's division, there's discrimination, and it's just, it's hard. And as Christians, it's hard because we see our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that we're discriminating against people too, and that we're trying to use the Bible to sway one side over another. And today in James we're going to be looking at the sin of partiality and that fits in perfectly with what we're going through now. Um, today we're going to be in James chapter 2. So so far in James we've looked at um, chapter 1 and the verses following. We've looked at taking joy in our trials because of Christ. We've looked at not when we're facing temptation not to be um, blaming God because God doesn't tempt us but he tests us and he draws us closer to him. And last week we looked at being doers of the word, not just hearers, because when we hear this word, we are to implant the knowledge into our hearts and then spread that into our context and our culture. So starting off in verse 1 and verse 1 to 13 today, he says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man you stand over there or sit down on my feet have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts for listen my beloved brothers has not god chose chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him but you have dishonored the poor man are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the courts? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you have been called? For if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails on one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. So in the first verse, James is giving Christians a command to not show any partiality because we are called Christians under the name of Christ. And then in verses 2 to 3, he's going to give us a scenario, and he's going to bring up um, the imagery of a rich man and a poor man, which he's already addressed. He's already talked about a cultural issue that they're facing of a rich of rich people versus poor people. And in verse 2, he says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit on my feet. When he says the word assembly, he's, re he's referring to the church. He's not restricting it to when a person comes in the church. He's just saying when this happens in the church, especially because we are Christians, we are not to elevate people because of their appearance, because he gives us the imagery of a rich man who has material things, who has an image, versus a poor man who we will look down upon. And then in verses 4 to 7, 
he's going to give us the consequences to that scenario. So he's saying, he's going to say, you've, if you've made this distinction, then this is what's going to happen. So in verse 4 he says, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? For listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and hearers, and sorry, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. For are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the courts? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you have been called? So what he's saying in verse 4 7 is he's saying that. You guys have already, if you've already elevated this rich person and neglected this poor person, you have already drawn a line in the sand. You have already committed sin. And you are to remember that as Christians, that our material wealth and whatever we have that's on this earth is not going to last, that we have a, a rich freedom in Christ, that we are heirs of the kingdom. And then he's going on to say further that the rich people are going to drag us in the course that they're going to oppress us, that the rich material things are going to be used against us. And he says that we are just honoring the poor by showing favoritism to the, to the rich man. And then in verses 8 to 13, he's going to say, so he's already he's given us a command, he's given us a scenario, and now he's talking about the consequence. But in verses 8 to 13, what he's going to say is he's like, this is what happens when you elevate the person. And he's going to remind us, this is why you don't do that. So in verse 8 he says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing well. But if you have shown partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not commit murder. For if you do commit adultery and but do murder, Excuse me. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, then you will become a transgressor of the law. He's saying that as Christians, we have an obligation to love our neighbor. That he's, he's going back to the Old Testament to the Ten Commandments. He's going back to the Old Testament into the Ten Commandments and saying, "You are to love your neighbor as yourself." And he gives this imagery that, and he's again he's speaking to Christians who know that Christ is the only one who has fulfilled the law because he's fully man, fully God. And he's giving this thing of, well, if you're going to treat this person this way and elevate them, then you're already breaking one part of the law. He said, if, if you keep it, which he, know, he knows that they can't keep it, then we're accountable for it, just like we're accountable for our sins. And what he's going to say in verses 10, 12 to 13, he's going to resolve this by reminding them what we are to do. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. And that phrase, law of liberty, that's the second time that phrase has come up so far in, in James. And that's referring to the word of God. And he's saying in verse 13 that, or excuse me, verse 12, that we are to be judged, that we are to live out this word, and that we are to be judged through this word, through the power of the Spirit, and looking at this word as seeing our sin, but seeing the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And then in verse 13, I love this because it gives us such a beautiful image of the cross. He says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, for mercy triumphs over judgment. He's saying that when you guys, when you elevate a rich person and neglect a poor person, you are not only neglecting the poor person, but you are giving judgment, but you're not showing mercy. And then he ends by saying mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's such a beautiful image of the cross because Christ paid for our sins past, present, and future without judgment, but boldly came down fully man, fully God, and boldly died for our sins. And this applies to us in our culture today because with all the, all the discrimination, all the hate, all the racism, everything that's going on in the country, it's hard to think through. It's hard to not give, um, give an opinion to one political party or another, to give credence to one person. But we are to remember that as Christians, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and not show favoritism because James is addressing the cultural issue of a rich of the rich versus poor but today we're battling we can battle that issue but right now presently we're facing issues of segregation discrimination and judgment and it's something where as christians we are called to love our neighbor and it's hard because we have our culture that's screaming at us to get things right to fix things and we have to remind them that yes we're here to help with that but we're to remind our we're to remind you guys and ourselves that we are sinful, that that's the base issue of all of this, in that when we look to who Christ is, that there is, only, that there is mercy in who he was and who he is still. So 
ways that you can do and, and the ways that you guys can do this because the two things that we should take from this is that we are commanded to not show partiality that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and that we are to again bear witness to who Christ is and who Christ has made us that we are free that we are that we are heirs of his kingdom that we are adopted into the family of God and it's hard with the limitations that we're in with our restrictions because we can't see our friends we really can't go outside and it's hard because how do we not show favoritism when we can't really do anything when we can't go outside and show favoritism something where the favoritism that we have plays out through judgment because what James is getting at is when he's saying when you guys see someone coming to the church don't judge them based off of their appearance judge them don't judge them but think about them love them as your neighbor and love them as Christ loved them and it's it's, it's hard because we want to show favoritism we want to judge people we want to get somewhere and try and be better the thing is when we show favoritism we're judging people and we're forgetting that God is fully sovereign. He is fully perfect. He is the perfect judge at the end of all times. But for now, we, we shouldn't judge people. We shouldn't show favoritism. And a simple way that you guys can do that is think about how you're looking at people. Think about when you have small groups or you see people in your neighborhood and just think, I want to love these people. I don't want to judge them based off their race or their wealth or whatever they have. So as you guys go throughout your week, remember that showing favoritism is a sin, that we are commanded not to do that, that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I want to leave you guys with this. It says in uh, the story in Genesis 37 um, where Joseph is sold into slavery because Joseph is his uh, dad's favorite, and his brothers are jealous of that. They try to um, kill him, then he gets sold into slavery. And it's great because the end of verse 13 applies to the end of Genesis 37 where, the, where Joseph is reunited with his brothers and he says, and he, and he shows them mercy. And something where just that imagery of how Joseph could have judged and could have been vengeful, he was merciful. And it's something where with your family, with your friends, showing favoritism, and I'm not talking about like you can like have your opinion on what you think is better for lunch with McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, but I'm talking like when you judge and look at someone's appearance, look at them as created in the image of God, created in the image of God. So everybody's sinful, we're created in the image of God, and that we are to look to Christ to free us because he died for our sins past, present, and future. So as you go throughout your week, remember that favoritism is a sin, that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us, and that we are to continue in this process. Even when all this is over, that doesn't give us a pet that does not give us a pass to stop loving our neighbor. I hope that you all stay safe and have a good week.